Hello guys, Arkand here. Welcome back to another Let's Read. And this time we're going to do Eden's Reach Visual Novel by Azzy Ford. So let's start. My ears ring as the sound of those damned alarms pierce my eardrums, red blaring across my vision. Red lights are spiraling across a nearly endless hallway, slightly illuminating the metal tiles below me. The air is thin, almost making me suffocate with each breath I take. I try to feel my body and make sense of what was happening. My fur is all bristled, and I can't make out why. Suddenly, a force pushes me onward to the hallway, indistinct screaming coming from all directions around me. The... Ka... M... Confusion continues to fill my mind as I feel something pull on my arm. It was a tight grip, a sensation I'd never felt before. It keeps urging me to move forward, and like clockwork, my body just moves. I slowly lose all control of my body as one thought invades my mind. Run! Just keep running! The grip on my arm suddenly loosens as I continue running forward. Suddenly, a gleam of light comes from the end of the hallway. A door. There are several windows strewn across the edges, glowing in stark contrast of blue compared to the rest of the dreary atmosphere of this corridor. I start bolting towards the door, yet I slowly notice that I wasn't moving. At all. I was stuck in place, kind of like in a treadmill. It adjusts itself based on how fast or slow I'm moving. Yet, the screams and banging footsteps from behind me kept drawing closer and closer. Suddenly, a loud bang sound echoes through my ears, jolting me awake. Oh, that dream again. That'll teach me to watch horror movies at midnight. That dream's been coming back a lot more often lately. It goes around the same key steps. The alarms blaring, the sudden force on my arm, then that sound. It varies from each instance. Sometimes it's a splattering of blood. Other times it's the sound of a gunshot. Although it still bothers me every now and again, I've learned to just live with it and not let it impede my schedule. And yes, surfing the web in my PJs for most of the day looking for DJ gigs is a valuable use of my time. I groan as I toss and turn across my bed, searching for my phone under the rubble of my belongings on my end table. The alarm had been going off for 30 minutes now. It was supposed to wake me up by 9am, but now it's 9.31. Not too late, I guess. I sit by the edge of my bed, stretching as my tail escapes the warm embrace of my blanket. After doing some standing stretches, I go through my closet, gathering some new clothes to replace my pajamas. Oh, the MC's so cute. <laughs> Disrobing my comfy, comfy PJs off my body, I take the time to appreciate myself in front of my mirror. The more I stare at myself though, the more I regret not going to the gym with Dylan more often. Your body's fine. After that disappointing display, I sluggishly put on my shirt and some baggy shorts, my phone placed in one of the pockets. Wow, this home is real swanky. I walk towards the kitchen in a similar fashion to make myself some breakfast. As I begin to plant my butt onto one of the seats, though, I receive a text from someone. I unlock my phone and I'm greeted by another notification. UOS version? Ah, crap. I gotta re-input all of my information again. I fumble around the screen a bit, making sure my big paws wouldn't accidentally let go of the small-ass projector module. Those things are so tiny, about as thin as a single french fry among the boxes they sell in fast food restaurants downtown. After going through that boring process again, the update asks for my name. Well, that was easy. Let me just type it in here. I'm gonna name him... Averick. Name confirmed. Enjoy your new operating system, Averick. The AI butchered my name a bit, but that's about expected at this point. After exiting my phone settings, I go through all my other notifications. Among them was a text from Dylan. As I grab the carton of milk from the fridge and a box of cereal from the cabinet, I read his text. Yo, Averick, got time to go to Burnham's today? I place the carton and box down on the table and start replying. I thought that coffee shop wasn't your style. 
Well, I was in the area, so you know, why not meet there? You're lucky I haven't eaten breakfast yet. Of course, Dylan's always been a bit spontaneous with his meetups. I regrettably put back the milk carton in the fridge, as well as a box of cereal in the cabinet. Maybe next time, my darlings. I grabbed my sling bag that was hung on a rack, placing my phone and my wallet in it. I then went to take my headphones from my bedroom and resync them to my phone. The update must have disconnected them from my PC's cloud, as most of my personal playlists were gone. Well, so much for a diverse walk across the neighborhood. After brushing my head fur with a comb, I grabbed my favorite flip-flops from the rack next to the door, bursting it open with some enthusiasm. Ah, watch out, Bayline City! Eric's here to see the light of day! I wrapped my headphones around my ears, adjusting around them automatically to fit my anatomy. It was a nuisance that the store brands in my area never really got them right for my species. Besides, I love these bad boys better because I made them. I take out my phone and start my playlist, beginning my walk towards Burnham's Coffee Shop, one of my favorite places to just take a seat and relax. I'd do it more often if only my wallet agreed with that kind of lifestyle. There was a small scattering of crowds across the sidewalk, but the grounded air traffic was always a marvel. All this cool technology that I usually take for granted just sticks out to me today. Was it boredom? Was it because I stayed home for a week straight? Regardless of the reason, I simply stare at the zooming cars and drones in the sky and the equally fast vehicles on the ground. The music on my phone only amplified the atmosphere, my head bopping as I immersed myself around the turn towards the city plaza. But the plaza itself was as stunning as everything else around it. It's a haven for basically all walks of life, however dull or exciting it may be. Just plop down some of Eden Core's hard light emitters and you've basically set the stage for whatever you want to do around here. There were the usual street performers around the corner and the service robots selling ice cream on their floating carts. The crowds forming around the fast food chains mixed with the more high-end restaurants could not be missing. It certainly speaks volumes that the crowd was already this dense so early in the morning. The plaza is well known for its nighttime view, after all. As I made my way towards Burnham's Coffee, there was a rather loud crowd piercing through my music. I take my headphones off out of curiosity, collapsing onto my paw as I investigate what made all that commotion was about. To my disappointment, it was just another of those protests against the Eden core. I never really understood all the hate around the company. Sure, I'm not blind to all the drama they stir up, but they've certainly done more good than anything else, being the pioneers of the medical technology industry. They thrust the country to being one of the leading powers of society. That was how the endless amounts of articles I've read described them, anyway. Well, out of sight, out of mind. I ignore the protesters as I continue to make my way towards the coffee shop which is just short ways behind the central fountain area. It was something I liked about the location, hidden away from the rest of the glittery shops taking all the major crowds, leaving the more calm and quiet atmosphere to the back end. The door automatically slides open as I step onto the carpet, the smell of fresh coffee beans greeting me on the way in. Ooh. Ah, Burnham's Coffee. Everything about the place just spells relaxing. It's one of the few places where I honestly prefer the coffee shop's smooth jazz to my own music, often getting lost in the atmosphere of the place. My allured state is cut short as someone snaps their fingers in front of me. Yo, where's the Averick? Gah! Oh, it's just you. Ah, this excitable kangaroo. He's an absolute short to keep up with sometimes. This time around though, I kind of need his energetic attitude. Mornings are always the most tempting times to just do nothing and laze about, and while it can be difficult, I do enjoy his company. A lot. We've been attached to the hip since high school, and I couldn't imagine someone else helping me through dropping out of college other than him. It's even practical, considering he did it first. Jeez, I don't know what you see in this place that always gets you so high. If you had some taste for aesthetics, you'd be high too. Please, my taste is better than yours. Only in your wet dreams, D. Dylan grabs me by the shoulder, dragging me towards a pair of seats. He sat down on one of those special extra comfy seats that only the early regulars usually take. Guess he was really close in that area. Did you order anything already? I take my seat next to him, unwrapping the sling bag from my shoulder in the process. Ha! <laughs> you know I don't order shit from coffee shops. Yeah, and you always make me order milk tea with you. It's infinitely better than the stuff you drink in the morning. 
or you just have an insatiable sweet tooth. I take my wallet out of my bag, standing up as Dylan stretches a bit behind me. You got an order the usual? Yep, mocha frap, baby. I immediately go to the lineless counter, the cashier looking at me quite expectantly. I'm a semi-regular here, so we're quite familiar with each other. The usual, Averick? Hit me with the best you got. The cashier rings me up and lets me scan my phone for the receipt. It only takes about half a minute for the entire thing to be ready, thanks to the mix of a barista and some high-tech machinery to get the whole thing done. Here you go! Enjoy the coffee! Thanks! I eagerly take a few sips off the cup, its pure mocha taste and cold liquid running down through my throat. It was always the best feeling in the world, drinking from this place. The blend of bitter and sudden sweet aftertaste that the drink somehow captures just completes my morning. I plant my butt onto my seat once more, with Dylan just scrolling through his phone as his ears perk up to greet me. Yo, Averick, just got news of that gig you wanted me to check on. My eyes widen as I place my mocha frap down on the table. I've been waiting for him to get back to me for almost half a month now. Y you actually got me a spot at that nightclub? Yep, the same one I mowed light on. I had my boss check your stuff and he's willing to give you a chance. Holy shit, D, that nightclub's gonna get me set up for sure. His smile suddenly disappears though, as he gets another text from what I assume is his boss. Well, better get your best tracks coming, because he said he can only give you later at night for a slot. Seriously? That early? A pit in my stomach begins to form as panic starts setting in. I drink my frap to try and calm myself down, but D knew that wasn't going to work. Say, Averick, I know you're nervous and all, but we better get you ready for tonight. I can even lend you some spending cash if you're short. But I already owe you, what, a few grand at this point? Well, one of us isn't teetering around being a homeless husky with only a DJ pad and a cute face to his name. <laughs> uh, okay, but I'm definitely paying you back with the money from this gig. All the better. Dylan pulls me by the arm as he brought me out of Burnham's, almost making me spill my frap. I hastily pull my sling bag with me, creating a chaotic chain of energy, with Dylan leading the fray. D, D, slow down! It won't be until tonight. Exactly why we've got to get through the entire plaza. The entire plaza? But I don't need that much for the gig. Shush, less talk, more walking. Come on, chop chop. Eventually reached the center of the plaza at a breakneck pace, causing quite a ruckus between the two of us. I could only hope that the entirety of Bayline City isn't looking at these two idiots in its most foot traffic heavy landmark. Could you please just slow down for a moment? It's not like we're in any rush. Really? Judging by my last look at your wardrobe, our current pace is definitely warranted. Wh what's wrong with my usual duds? Trust me, your clothes ain't gonna cut it in my joint. It's as much a fashion contest as it is a DJ gig there. I decide to ignore several jabs at my choice of clothing, despite wanting to tear him a new one. I just sigh as I pull Dylan to a stop and turn him around to face me. Come on, D. Judging by the way you described it, it's clear that my wallet can't take the beating for stuff your bar considers passable. Ah, uh, hello. That's why I'm here to pay for it. I'll get the cheapest options, if that helps to ease your conscience. Dylan proceeds to wrap his arms around my shoulders as he ruffles my head for He knows damn well how to soften me up for any of his ideas. This is just one of the easier tactics he can pull. My fur... Stop being such a crybaby. You'll have plenty of time to get ready, right? Ah, uh, fine. But I get to pick the store. Aw, oh, but it's half the fun. That's why I'm taking it. Dylan and I walk around the plaza's commercial district a while, going through the different boutiques and clothing shops littered in the area. Not a lot of them fit the vibe I was looking for, or they were too expensive, both for me and Dylan. Hmm, this one? What there once? Their clothes are too tight! Really? And here I thought your slim physique let you slip through anything. A little benefit of not having big buns for pecs. The buttons on these clothes would literally fly off if you wore them. 
Something tells me you'd still enjoy the view, though. Oh, shut up, D. I revel in my small display of sarcasm as another store catches my attention. It carries such a different atmosphere compared to the other surrounding stalls and stores. The inside is mostly blocked out, and it sticks out with its dark paint job amidst the otherwise bright and glittery plaza architecture. Hey, this place seems promising. Let's see. Neon Peaks? I think I've heard of this place. His face lights up with curiosity as if he's only seeing this place for the first time. I've only vaguely heard of something like this being set up a few months ago, which explains a the contrasting theme. Well, I'm all ears. What do you know? This here is an electronics store. They sell some armlets and phones in there, but it's fused with a surprising amount of cosmetics. And they're less about design and more about flexible functionality. Whoa, where'd that sudden spiel come from? Heard it from a bar patron. Couldn't stop hyping this place up to his friend. I didn't think they'd actually build a branch downtown. Huh, and what about that flexible functionality this place is known for? I may have an idea. I'm gonna be keeping it as a surprise though. Of course you will. I roll my eyes as I enter the store and, and am immediately immerse deep into the atmosphere. The hard masonry of the plaza was replaced by the soft foam to carpet flooring of the store. The place has a cooler hue of blue to it, which only amplifies the ambience playing in the sound systems. Holy shit, they weren't kidding about this place. I think I just found my favorite store in the plaza. Hey, hey, don't lose focus. Our goal's right there. He points towards the doorless closet filled with both folded and hanging clothes. I rush towards it and peruse the selection as soon as I am able, with Dylan to the side casually helping me out. As I kept flipping through several vests and jackets, I started slowly realizing what Dylan meant by flexible functionality. Most of the selection is RGB synced clothes that change and react to the store system. Upon closer inspection, they're surprisingly cheaper compared to other brands. These cut nearly half the usual cost. As I continue browsing through the rows of clothes, Dylan suddenly pokes my shoulder. Hey, Averick, I bet that'll look great on you. Hmm, okay, let me try it on then. Oh, nice. I quickly put on the RGB jacket that he pointed out to me. Afterward, Dylan takes me by the shoulders and ushers me in front of the full-length mirror nearby. I look at my reflection, observing the jacket in its full glory. It wasn't particularly snug if a bit baggy. I guess the tailors had, well, bigger people in mind when they designed these. It's pretty big. It was the only size they got. Besides, I'm sure you'll grow into it. Hmm, I guess the size is fine. But what about the price tag? Don't worry about it. But if it bothers you so much, it's actually the cheapest option that looks decent. The real question is whether you like it or not. Yeah, I do actually. I'll have to tweak around the settings a bit, but this one speaks to me the most. I quickly take off the jacket and hand it to Dylan. He takes the liberty of folding it neatly before wrapping it around his arm. I straighten out my shirt as it was dragged by the jacket, while Dylan pulls out his wallet. Alright, I'll just have this rung up. Why don't you wait outside? No thanks, I'll just walk around in here for a bit, browse through the rest of the selection. Gotcha. Meet me by the entrance? I give him a nod as he makes his way towards the register. I go about my way and browse through the rest of the electronics section first, which is just opposite the apparels. They even sell the latest armlets in the market, all decked out in those boxes also used for watches. I guess they serve the same purpose, but that only begs the question as to why watches even exist to this day. Suddenly, my phone rings from receiving a notification. I take it out of my bag and pop the screen up. Immediately, I see a message from an unknown number. I open it cautiously, knowing that even text messages can be catalysts for some forms of viruses that I can't fathom how devious people produce in the first place. Hello, you're Averick, yeah? Uh, who is this? I'm Mr. Aloysius, Dylan's boss at the Midnight Sun Bar. I usually go by Mr. Oswald. Either that, or just call me Oswald. Keeps things simple. Oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't familiar with your number. Heh. <laughs> It's no problem at all. Oh, and before you ask where I got your number, Dylan gave it to me. Yeah, I felt like that might be the case. Right, I'll let Dylan fill you in on the rest of the details, but I'll give you the directions to the bar. Unless you're carpooling with Dylan, of course, which mostly makes me texting you a bit unnecessary. 
I guess that is true, but I don't want to come off as being ungrateful. Wait, maybe it's better to just agree with what he's saying? Oh jeez, this is why I don't want to deal with bosses. Okay, Averick, calm down. What to say? I will appreciate him. That doesn't necessarily mean it was for nothing. Maybe something will happen and Dylan and I might not go to the bar together. Then the directions might come in handy. It takes a while for Mr. Oswald to respond to that, but when I did receive his reply, it was rather short. I see. Thank you for the words, Averick. I'll be expecting you tonight. Of course, Mr. Oswald. Wait, expecting me? I wonder if that's a good or a bad thing. I set aside my worries, not wanting to pile even more stress onto my psyche. He seemed to like what I said, though, so I guess I didn't fuck up on that account. I go through the path to the exit when I bump into Dylan on the way. He was holding a bag, presumably with my jacket inside, which he nearly dropped because of me. Whoops. You definitely need more spatial awareness, Averick. S sorry We make our way back to the central plaza. Dylan holding the bag close to his body. He stops me by the fountain, tugging me by the nape. I immediately stop dead in my tracks as he hands me the bag. Inside it is the jacket and the data chip wrapped in the hard box. The chips for the directions and the sinking. I'm sure you know your way around it. This ain't my first day around the gyroscope. I'll figure it out. Good. I've still got a few errands to run, so I probably won't be able to pick you up. Well, looks like the map's gonna be useful after all. That's fine. Mr. Oswald gave me directions. Really? When did he message you? Just a few minutes ago. Already sucking up to my boss, eh? Typical canine. Go screw yourself, D. We bump fists before going our separate ways. I take a glance at the direction he was headed, and it really is opposite of where I was headed. The bag in my hand shakes a fair bit as I quickly make my way back home, filled with excitement to get this jacket set up. I hastily sped through my apartment complex, nearly blasting the door off the hinges of excitement. The bustling city sounds were starting to pick up from outside, but my apartment mostly blocks it off, leaving this feeling of being isolated from the rest of the chaotic world, letting me do things at my own pace. I go inside my room, placing the bag on my bed as I take out its contents. Alright, time to do this. Later that day, The time to perform in the midnight sun has come as quickly as the news reached me. I could already hear the music inside rather faintly, making me tug onto my new jacket out of anxiety. This is it. Behind the bouncer in front of me is the start of my actual career. I take a deep breath, stealing my nerves for what's to come. Then, as I make my first step, someone suddenly pounces on me, nearly tipping me over. Hey, look at you! Jeez, D, did you really have to? Involuntarily cut off as soon as I saw Dylan's whole getup. He looks all dapper in that tight ass looking clothing. Knowing him, he probably can't endure that kind of crap for long. What? You like what you see or something? <laughs> Sorry, just not used to you looking like a responsible adult. Don't get used to it. Serving drinks to drunkards certainly isn't responsible. Whatever you say, bartender. We both make our way to the front entrance where the bouncer is guarding the neon gilded doors with as little as a droplet of emotion in his being besides scary. <laughs> he stared me down like I was some kind of troublemaker, taking occasional glances at Dylan. The bouncer stops us right where we stood, his large paw standing in the way. His height was even more intimidating though, as he towers over both me and Dylan by a huge margin. Hold it right there. What's your business here, pup? His grim tone sends shivers down my spine and his scowl certainly wasn't helping. Uh, um, I'm j just The hell's wrong with you? Cat who got your tongue? Spit it out already. That's enough from you, you big lug. Stop scaring him already. Sorry, you know scaring the shit out of newbies is the only fun I get around here. Aw, and I thought me checking on you every now and again was enough, Max. Aw, boohoo. Bless your poor, delicate, rue heart. Dylan and the big tiger bouncer, apparently named Max, share a hearty laugh before performing a quick secret handshake. Did, did the atmosphere just change when these two started talking? I can't believe it. The air definitely seems... different? It's as if all the tension from earlier just dissipated. 
So, D, what's he really here for? Um, I can answer that myself. Max looks at me with an air of skepticism on both his face and tone. Oh, you look like a shriveling prune when I asked you a few seconds ago. I want to tell him that it was his fault why I was like that, but what good would that do? Instead, I just answer promptly. I'll be performing as a DJ here. Oh, you sure you can handle everyone staring at him? He's got nerves of steel when he's on stage. It's a shame you won't get to see it. Yeah, yeah. Just don't indulge the assholes in there. Don't want to add some extra work on my palate. I'll do my best, as always. Dylan then grabs me by the shoulder and ushers me inside on my own as Max opens the doors for the bar. I walk away from the two and suddenly, I hear the sound of cloth rustling accompanied by Dylan gasping. The two of them proceed to playfully roughhouse a bit before Dylan follows my lead. What was that about? You wouldn't understand. I guess you're right. Never mind, then. We enter the bar, and immediately I were assaulted by an array of strobe lights and blasting music. People were dancing in the middle of the bar, the dance floor a pattern of squares lighting up in all manner of different colors. The bar was just to the left of the dance floor, manned by a brown wolf in a rather expensive looking tux. Dylan rushes to the bar right away, catching the wolf's attention. Mr. Oswald, sorry, I'm a bit late, but here, I have this guy with me. Oh, I'll be with you in just a sec. Mr. Oswald walks around the bar, approaching me and Dylan briskly. He lets out a slight huff as he greets us with quite a welcoming expression. Dylan, and you must be Avery. Glad you could make it. The bar is extra busy today, so I'm counting on you. He says the last part while looking at Dylan. I'll do my best as always, Mr. Oswald. Alright, now, as for you. He looks me over with a rather expectant expression, and just like that, the pressure started piling on. Come with me backstage, Avery. We'll have your briefing there. Uh, alright. I follow him towards the other end of the bar where the backstage is. It appears to be covered by a bunch of curtains. As we make our way to it, my eyes wander around the building, observing the strobe lights and the other attachments near it. There are a few box-like structures that were dimly lit on the strobe light setup, and I instantly recognize what they were. Hard light emitters. Why aren't they being put to use? I put these thoughts in the back burner for now though, as Mr. Oswald pulls the curtain to the backstage aside, gesturing for me to go in first. I enter as Midnight Sun's owner fiddles around on some panels attached to the wall, apparently setting up some mood lighting, with his tux unwinding a bit as he turns to face me once again. What a busy night. I muster up the courage to speak to him, despite how nerve-wracking this whole situation is making me feel. Is something the matter, Mr. Oswald? Hmm? You seem awfully stressed. I was just... I'm fine, Avery. Just a late night rush. You should be worrying about your performance anyway. Oh, oh alright. Is there anything I need to know about the whole setup? Mr. Oswald proceeds to brief me on the usual stuff I've come to expect from gigs like this. Protocols, equipment, how I sync it, all that. I mostly zoned out halfway because I've heard this spiel a few times already. Then, there's the acoustics around here. What about them? Let's just say that it isn't exactly the most immersive experience. A lot of the DJs have put their own spin on the audio settings to make it sound decent, but it hasn't really done much good. Huh, do you have any idea why? If I had to guess, it's the bar itself. It's not structured well enough for the music to really get the blood pumping. Unfortunately, I can't spare the funds to get some dedicated equipment. Well, that is a problem. The acoustics are a big problem. You won't be able to showcase the music well enough, and it's no wonder that it was blasting at the entrance. The sound's unfocused, all over the place. As I contemplated what the problem was, an idea suddenly sprang to mind. The hard light emitters. Excuse me? The bar has some hard light emitters attached to the strobe lights. We can use them to create a dome for the sound to bounce off of. Hmm. The way their structure can isolate the sound more. But it can't make an entire dome surrounding the dance floor, especially in a closed-off environment like this. It doesn't have to be an entire dome, just enough for the speakers to bounce the sound off the curved hard light nicely. Mr. Oswald thinks for a moment before he begins to fiddle with his phone. After he does something, a file comes through my phone. It's the access key to the hard light system of the bar. 
complete with nearly everything at my disposal. I look at Mr. Oswald as he puts his phone back in his pocket. This is me trusting you to give a killer performance. He pats me on the shoulder before he disappears onto the other side of the curtains. I was left feeling uneasy. I was nervous about performing, sure, but that was minuscule compared to the added pressure coming from Mr. Oswald's trust. Somehow, that weighs on me way more than it should. Alright, calm down. I looked towards the DJ on the stage. He was ripping through the panels, his mixing near perfect. The entire crowd was popping to his command. The confidence he's sporting has oozed off of his entire being. If he can do that with less than stellar acoustics, then I can do that too. It doesn't take long for him to finish ripping through his pad on stage. After a few finishing flourishes, clearly trying to take off the lasting numbness from an intense gig, he quickly goes down the steps. I know that feeling all too well. He disappears from view onto the other side of the stage, which slowly meant it was my cue. I get a text from Mr. Oswald as I ready myself to get onto the steps. You're up. Any last minute requests? Hmm, can you kill the lights? And just like that, the lights of the bar are all turned off. The crowd silent, taken aback by the sudden artificial brown up. I take a deep breath as I activate the hard light dishes on the strobe lights. Whoa, that is so awesome. It's time to get lit, folks. I see the fire. I slam my hands on my pad, bringing a burst of light waving through the dance floor. My jacket lights up in the same tones as my DJ pad, slowly illuminating the bar once more in a neon hue. My gaze slowly rises to the crowd as the bass kicks in. Whoa, so colorful. I start tapping on the beat repeatedly, and the strobe lights come to life accordingly. I start freestyling on the synths as I put the beats on repeat. Each step after another, I slowly drilled my focus more and more onto the track, ignoring the crowd around me almost entirely. I'm sure Dylan's watching me. Maybe Mr. Oswald too, if he isn't busy. But right now, they don't matter. I take quick glances at the crowd. They're completely immersed in the music, much deeper into a trance than they ever were before. I didn't know much of the specific details, but does that really matter? When I'm on the pad, I'm in control. Before I knew it, the performance was over. A slight silence follows before the crowd erupts in applause, requesting an encore. As much as I'd love to oblige though, there's still another DJ waiting. I half-heartedly bow to the crowd and make my way onto the other flight of stairs afterward, shaking the tension off my limbs while I attempt to calm myself down. When I reach the last flight of stairs, Mr. Oswald greets me with a big smile. He gives me a pat on the back again as he leads me towards the bar. Drinks on the house for tonight. You earned it after all that. Really, sir? I was just doing what I usually do. Mr. Oswald sits on one of the stools, patting on a cushion of the other one next to him. Is that so? If that's the case, I'd like to hear more about what you usually do. I take a seat on the bar stool at Mr. Oswald's left as he signals Dylan for two drinks. I was half hoping I'd get to choose the free drinks for myself, but I guess not. My idle gaze slowly drifts towards Dylan as his quick handiwork needs my attention. His mixology skills are awe-inspiring and eye-catching, but Mr. Oswald redirects my attention towards him. So, Avery, where have you been hiding in the industry? Um, what do you mean by that, Mr. Oswald? He lets out a slight chuckle as he scratches his muzzle a bit. First, we're way past the honorifics. Oswald's fine, since you've definitely earned my respect. Oh, alright then, uh, Oswald. I stutter a bit as I try to rewire my brain to do as he says. Second, what you showed out there, before and during the performance, that wasn't just some run-of-the-mill DJ. You could have fooled me if you said you were biggie in the market. Ah, that's quite the high praise, especially coming from someone like you. We exchanged a few silent gazes, his vision flicking between me and what I assume is Dylan from time to time. I slowly get lost in his eyes, vibrantly piercing through the dominating hue of the bar. This might be it. This guy might get me into the rest of the high end of the industry. All those hurdles that I thought were insurmountable. This man could make me leap through all of them. I can't let this chance pass me by. Eventually, Dylan arrives with our drinks. Here you go. Today's special, Vita Sunrise. 
Oswald and I look at Dylan as the room winks at me playfully before he goes to another patron. The wolf in front of me chuckles once more as he downs the drink in one go, gently putting the glasses down in front of me and him. I have to admit, I'm very impressed at Dylan's craftsmanship even though this is a rather simple beverage. It's also quite aesthetically pleasing as I slosh it around a bit. World's full of surprises. P pardon Nothing. Just thinking that Dylan, of all people, got me a gem of a person as a DJ for my bar. It's a humbling experience, is all I'm saying. I simply stare at him as I realize that he's referring to me. I blush a bit as I avert my gaze into my drink, hesitating to drink it. I've had alcohol before, sure, but with Oswald right in front of me, it'll make it hard to keep down. Something wrong? You haven't touched your drink at all. It's nothing, Oswald. Just a little nervous. Whatever for? Well, even you have to admit the difference between you, an owner of a rather well-known bar, to me, a DJ from the countryside. Oswald thinks for a moment. He eyes me from head to toe, making me wonder if I said anything wrong. I take a slow sip out of my drink, wanting to silence myself under the glass. I occasionally give worried glances his way as he reclines himself from the bar counter, letting out a sigh. Yes, that may be true in some way, but I don't think we're that much different at all. Huh? Let me level with you, Avery. Come here. He signals me with his paw to move closer, and I do so. Yes, the Midnight Sun Bar might be a local specialty up in the city, but that's all there is. You're thinking this place is amazing, it's the same as the look of people in the high-rise bars of the skyscrapers. Is that so? Yep, in my eyes, we're the same. truth is there in his words. It's precisely why we're the same that I want to. Oswald's ears suddenly perk up as one of them twitches. He places his finger onto what I assume is an earpiece as I hear muffled speaking on the other end. Oswald's face turns grim while listening on. I begin to worry about what's being said, but Oswald starts to speak again before I could ask what was wrong. No, no, we can't cause a scene in front of the bar. Yes, I can handle it. Just let them in. We on standby for my signal. Right. I stay silent as Oswald's face turns a bit tense. He focuses on the entrance of the bar, expecting someone to enter. I feel the same tension he carries in the air within me, my body growing stiff. It's as if his eyes were drilled onto me, instead of what's behind me. Dylan. He says it in a deep, serious tone, his cheers all but gone at this point. Y yes Mr. Oswald? Make sure you save the good glasses. I look towards the entrance behind me. Two heavily cloaked, suspicious-looking men come into the bar, menacingly approaching us. I'd have the instinct to just run for it, but seeing Oswald stand his ground, with a scowl nonetheless, somehow makes me want to do the same as well. Mr. Oswald Loisius, one of the men spoke in a gravelly, cold voice under the trench coat. Yes, that is me. Do you need anything? Perhaps a complimentary drink to take the edge off? The other person circles around me and Oswald, standing behind the wolf. You and your buddy seem to really need it. We're not here to exchange pleasantries. You see, we prefer to get to the point. The two of them begin to close in on Oswald, their aura just extruded, threatening, yet the wolf remained unfazed as he clenched his glass. As one of the men lands his paws on Oswald's shoulder, Dylan suddenly comes rushing in from behind me. Hey, hey, hey! What are you two doing? Shake him off this pl- Dylan's words are cut short as the man closer to me lands a clear punch to his gut, causing the kangaroo to crumple upon the ground. I immediately try to come to his aid and examine him. He holds his stomach as he groans in pain, his face full of agony. Dylan! Before I can even process what has happened to Dylan, the men begin to get handsy with Oswald. They rough him up a bit while he growls under his breath. I watch us, even when he's being manhandled, he doesn't back down. He keeps fighting. If we truly are the same, then he can't just stand here like an idiot. <laughs> hey! The three men in front of me, including Oswald, look at me with surprise. 
I hesitate for a moment because of the sudden gazes pointed towards me as a result of my verbal outburst, but I steal myself once more. Let him go! You're gonna regret hurting my best friend! One of the men approaches me, turning my bravado into nothing more than an impish yelp from my being that I couldn't contain. Am I, little puppy? Well, maybe I should teach you a lesson or two. The man doesn't hesitate and starts inching closer. He swings a quick strike in towards my muzzle, and I reflexively flinch. I prepare myself for his fist to make contact, but it doesn't. I slowly open my eyes to see that Oswald is already right in front of me, the wolf holding the other beastman's balled up fist with his hand. Hey now, we're all civil people here, aren't we? No need for all of this needless roughhousing, especially in my beloved establishment. Grrr. The beastman backs away while Oswald fixes his tux. Hmm, <laughs> you'll regret defying his pup. I shrivel up a bit as the beastman who almost punched me spits those words out. Oswald then directs their attention to the back door. As I grow more focused on the other two, who at this point were in the process of leaving, a hand momentarily grips onto my right shoulder coming from someone behind me. It's Oswald, with his attention seemingly to his earpiece as he goes back to fiddling his armlet. Max, I need you here, ASAP. First aid, one person. Also, please escort the husky safely out of the bar. I still have some business to attend to. Uh, Oswald? I'm left speechless as he looks back at me with an unexpectedly gentle expression. It's okay, Averick. I'll take it from here. You go have a good night's rest, yeah? Uh, alright. Within a few seconds, Max arrives, first aid kit in hand. He has the scowl that he's worn since I got there. What a fucking nuisance. Uh, oh, you're Max, right? Oh, lovely. The pup remembered my name. So, I'm gonna get going or what? What about Dylan? I'm gonna have to babysit the idiot. Leaves the front door unguarded, so I had someone cover for me. Don't go adding on to my workload now. Uh, Alright, just please make sure he's okay. He'll be fine. He's got a lot tougher skin than you, that's for sure. I'll just take that as an okay. The target is certainly difficult. I watch him carry Dylan onto his back, taking a few quick glances at them, with Max being surprisingly gentle with the roo. He responds accordingly to the pain groans my best friend was making. I appreciate the gesture, in a way. At least he's careful with what he has to be. Or maybe it has something to do with Dylan's relationship with his co-workers. I proceed to just place all of my thoughts and questions on the back burner for now, feeling increasingly exhausted as I make my way towards the exit. I just go and leave the tension of the situation that had just occurred behind me. As soon as I exit the bar though, things begin to feel off. The roads downtown seem rather empty, barren even. And though this place doesn't really get the most foot traffic at this time of night, there should still be a few people walking around. Yet here I am on this empty sidewalk with no other living being within sight. I proceed to cautiously wait at the bus stop, placing my DJ pad on the seat next to me. I remove my jacket, feeling rather uncomfortable because of the humid atmosphere. I then look through my phone and check the time for when the next bus is due to arrive. No signal. Strange. I was certain I had some on the way here. Fuck, all of this is starting to get really concerning. I wait for what feels like 30 minutes before the bus finally arrives, making me feel the sudden urge to gather my belongings and enter the bus quickly. As I climb the steps though, I quickly realize that it is just going to be only me on the passenger seats along with this driver on a rather late bus in the middle of the night. I decide to give the driver a curt nod as I scan my armlet for the bus pass, taking a seat as the vehicle drives off. We eventually reach the stop near the central plaza, and although the place is rather populated, the feeling that I've had since leaving the bar earlier never really left me. I check my phone for the time. It's 1.35am. That's way longer than the trip I took to get to the bar. I start worrying that something's gone terribly wrong. I hastily jog to my apartment, nearly stumbling on the steps as I make my way to my front door. Before I'm able to unlock the door though, a piece of paper plastered to it catches my eye. E eviction notice? No, this can't be. This isn't right. This must be some sort of mistake. The guy from the bar must have knocked me out cold. This, this is all just one big nightmare. 
My apartment's front door swings open, revealing the mostly empty interior. Everything essential, including my couch and dining table, all gone. All that's left are the dusty counters and my empty fridge. Even the rack next to my door isn't there along with all my shoes and flip-flops. Everything. I half-heartedly go through my bedroom door. I stare at the large space that my bed used to occupy. My closet and desks are gone, and the setup I worked my ass off for years to put together. No, I refuse to believe this. None of this is real. My rent isn't even true yet. I didn't even do anything wrong. It's just the, the stress. Yes, the stress of the day must have gotten to my head. I've read somewhere that if you realize you're dreaming, you can control what happens. So, if I think hard enough, my cabinets and fridge will be filled back up with my stuff again. My warm bed will be there and I will be able to embrace the sheets. My PC will be in the one stark corner of the room, blasting me with light. I commit these memories into intention as I slowly open the door. J just a nightmare. I want to believe that this is still all just a stupid nightmare, but no matter how many times I close my eyes hoping that everything I lost will come back to me, it doesn't happen. My mind wanders on all the things I could have possibly done over the month, the week, today. Then the realization suddenly hit me, coming down like a lightning bolt directly from the heavens. With it came the weight, the real weight, of those words previously spoken. Regret defying us. I collapse on the floor with the devastation weighing heavily on my chest. Tears run down the sides of my muzzle, and my whole body feels numb. How? Why did this all have to happen? It was only a few hours ago that I was having the time of my life back at Oswald's bar. I thought everything would be smooth sailing from there. Now, I'm even lower than I ever was before I dropped out, back in that dark place, where there was no hope, no chance. I was lucky enough back then that Dylan was there for me. But now? All the things I've worked for are gone. Now I'm nothing more than just a husky, with only a DJ pad and a cute face to his name. I sluggishly crawl towards the space where my bed used to be, the points where its legs left the mark still persisting on the foam flooring. I caress one of the markings with my paw while I lay myself, curled up from the cold air. I take out my new jacket and spread it out on top of me as a makeshift blanket, which admittedly doesn't do much, but at least it's something. I place my phone next to me, staring at the light it gives off as a slight ringing in my ears reverberates. I know I can't exactly stay here forever now that I'm evicted, but at least one more night, just one, then I leave for good. My eyelids become heavy as each second passes, growing more tired as tears continue to streak down the sides of my face. With the last remaining bit of my strength though, I manage to mumble out loud between sobs. Someone, please. Take me out of this nightmare. Okay, so I think this is a good stopping point. Okay, I'll just save. And then go back to the main menu. Okay, so that's it for my first episode of Eden's Reach, the visual novel. I have to say, I really like the music in this game. It's real, it's real, you know, lit. It's fire. You can really vibe to it. If you like the game so far, you can download it from Ichio. I'll put the link in the description. You can support the very nice developer of this game, Azzy Ford, by following him on his Twitter or through Coffee. I can provide those also in the description. So that's it for now guys. Thank you for listening. Bye!